Do I have to do some incantation? Shazam. Uh, Maps. There you go. <laughs> it was bound to happen. Watch this. Magic. There we go. Do I have to use the microphone, or can I just stand here? Um, so we're recording the audio so that we can make it available to others. <laughs> Oh, so I have to stand like here. Does this move? It does, kind of. Well, I just have to stand here. Um, hello. Hello. Hey. Yay, that energy. Um, so I want to talk about OpenStreetMap. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Steve Coast. I founded OpenStreetMap. Um, that means I did things like register the domain name, I wrote the software, I did these kinds of talks. Um, for many years, and as time's gone on, I've given all those thing, good things up to very capable people, um, which enables the project to, to grow and grow and grow. Um, I'm a Brit, but please don't shoot me. Um, I now live in the US. I'm married to an American, even. Um, so you can't get rid of me. Um, I live in Denver. Uh, and I mostly run around behind the scenes making OpenStreetMap function. Um, I sometimes rile people up. I mostly calm things down. Um, and I make sure the community functions at some level. What level that is, I don't know. So, welcome to Atlanta. It's very good to be here. It's very fun. It's my first time in Atlanta. Um, I want to sort of take a bit of a random look around OpenStreetMap's uh, past and future and give you kind of a little bit of an overview. There's not a huge amount of uh, structure here, but it should be fun. This is GPS data in London. Uh, the visualization you're seeing was made by a guy called Tom Harden and me. Um, you're seeing three days' worth of couriers driving around. As they drive around, uh, they have GPSs on them, which are leaving little traces. And the basic thesis of OpenStreetMap six years ago when it was started was that we could take this kind of data, not just from couriers, but also from people like you and me, and, and we could use that GPS data and make a map. Um, this was way before we thought that we might get aerial imagery or government data or anything like that. And there's some interesting things to note here. This is the beginning of, of one day, so it's about 6 o'clock in the morning now. They start driving around, they break for lunch there, drive around some more, then they go home, or go to the pub, and then at the end of the day, they go home from the pub. That's a little bit burst of activity there, because we're known for drinking in Britain. Um, if you aggregate all this data together, then you can get something that starts to look like a map. Obviously, there's a lot of inefficiencies there. You know, these couriers don't go down every road, but they do use the main roads every day. You can see that kind of frequency from you know, the thickness of the lines, which are just represented by the error in the GPS traces as they go along. Um, the other things to note are the blue lines are from one particular day, and the red lines are from another. So you can see that every day they go down the main roads, but some days they go down you know, one little road, some days they go down another little road. So where does OpenStreetMap exist? Well, maps. Uh, for the most part, aren't free, they aren't open. So free as in cost, open as in license, and they aren't particularly current. Maps tend to be pretty out of date. Uh, even if there were some subset of free, open, and current, then making them uh, a wiki, making them editable by everybody, is a pretty obvious thing to do. And it's also quite fun. So we have a lot of people around the world doing this kind of mapping. People like you, and people like this. This was the first state of the map in Manchester in England in, <coughs> someone remind me, 2006 or 2004? I can't remember. Um, this was the second one in Limerick in Ireland. Uh, the third one was in Amsterdam for no particular reason whatsoever. And the fourth one, uh, which was just last month or the month before, in Girona in Spain. And you can kind of see a progression. People get more colourful as we go on. And in fact, if you look at the bottom left, people start wearing capes. And <laughs> Super mapper, I don't know. Uh, all the countries are represented, um, and it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of workshops in OpenStreetMap. We have mapping parties. Um, I ran the first mapping party, which was in a place called the Isle of Wight, which is that tiny little island off the coast of England. It's about 30 miles across by 15 north to south. And what that meant was it was somewhere that we could map in a weekend with a sufficient number of people. We had about the number of people that was in this room at the very first mapping party. Um, this was the data that we had beforehand, and this is kind of a, a story around the world that map data is old and out of date. This is map data that's dropped into the public domain from approximately 50 years ago from the Ordnance Survey. The Ordnance Survey is Britain's uh, USGS, but with more money, I guess, um, and a worse license. The Ordnance Survey is a government entity, but it's in the private sector, which makes sort of has the worst of both worlds. 
Um, it makes it very difficult for anyone in the UK to play with maps without going to them because they're a monopoly and no one else has any map data of consequence. Um, they're also the official map data repository of the UK government, which makes them doubly a monopoly. There's a lot of stuff that's wrong with this map because it's old. There's roads that have been built since then. A lot of those black lines are uh, train lines that have been demolished since 1943 or whenever this was made. And so we wanted to um, you know, prove that we could map somewhere fairly uh, completely and then give that away for free. These are the traces that we had after a weekend. Um, you can see each different color represents a different person. This is before we had significant aerial imagery. We had people driving the country lanes, those are the sparse roads you see in between the, the towns. Um, we had people walking, biking the urban areas, um, and we even had people walking all the way around the coastline, believe it or not. Um, after that amount of time, you throw this together and you can make a map, which we gave for free. And this was one of those early sort of milestones in OpenStreetMaps history where we could prove that we could, you know, we had the technolo technology to do this, we had the infrastructure to do it, we had the people, we had the process, blah, blah, blah. It was all sort of tied together like with string as it almost is today as well, but it worked. Um, and this data was useful to people. We had mapping parties all around the world, places like this in England, and it led to a lot of interesting situations because we could map stuff that traditional mapping companies couldn't, right? So that big green bypass that goes around the sort of from 12 o'clock round to 6 o'clock was not actually open in this town when, when this mapping party happened. It looked like this, which allowed um, us to go and map it, but a national mapping agency is simply not allowed to. And it allowed us to get that map data up there much more quickly than a traditional map company could do. Um, and mapping parties you know, as I've said, a fun, and this one is particular one is from San Francisco a little while ago, and I think I even took this photo. But to give a bit of context to the history, you know, uh, this is how we looked um, at the first day of the map, I think in 07. Yeah, you can see the date, uh, 06, 08, 07, at the bottom right. We only had something like 9,000 users, but you could see that the graph was exponential, and it's always been that exponential. Um, comparing that to today, where, you know, we have... Uh, just over a quarter of a million. And I'll just explain that little drop at the, the top right. That's when we dropped about 10,000 uh, spam accounts because OpenStreetMap is successful enough that it attracts spammers, which I think is a really good bar to go for. Um, again, the graph is exponential, but you can see where we were in 2007, only there. 2008, uh, 2009, and then when we are today. So you can use this and make some predictions about where we'll be this time in 2011, uh, which I think is quite exciting. Um, all of our graphs look like that, you know, this just happens to be the number of ways, the, the number of uh, linear objects we have in the database. Um, so whenever someone asks you about OpenStreetMap, just say up and to the right. Um, I want to talk a bit about the licensed working group. Uh, some of you might know OpenStreetMap is trundling through a process to change license. The reason for that is that we're currently licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike, which is not explicitly usable for data. It's more for copyrightable works, whereas OpenStreetMap is hopefully a collection of facts. Facts like where the building is, what its name is, what the road is, where the road is, those kinds of things. So there's a thing called the uh, Open Database License, which was created by a bunch of different people, both here in the US and in the UK, and is run by an independent entity that we want to move to that license. Um, this, any license change in any open source project is a big controversial thing and anyone on the mailing list will have seen a lot of very fun discussions over the last few weeks and months. Um, but this, this process is run by the foundation's working group called License Working Group. And it's run by a guy called Mike Collinson who used to be on the board up until uh, last month. And mostly what they have to deal with are situations like this where you know, they, they get to choose between a bad situation and a worse situation. They get a lot of flack for that so I like to give them a little call out. Specifically because they move very, very slowly. Every, every decision they make is sort of uh, outlined by this cartoon by one of the people on the uh, mailing group, on the working group, I should say. The basic phases behind this license change are, firstly, we had to stop new sign-ups from, uh, from, from signing up under the Creative Commons license. So that happened on May the 12th. So now anyone who signs up in OpenStreetMap is licensed both under Creative Commons and also the Open Database license. Um, that's done. Phase two, uh, existing contributors signing up voluntarily. That just started this week. Uh, you've probably seen that on, on Twitter and as an official announcement uh, a few days ago. Um, in a little while, 
a couple of months. Um, existing mappers will be required to change over whenever you log in or use uh, OpenStreetMap. And by change over, I actually mean dual license. Um, and that's only if you use it. Uh, you could still just carry on uh, not editing an OpenStreetMap and your data will still be licensed CC by SA, but not OpenDBL. Um, and phase four is we remove people who are unresponsive and then we finish. Um, the basic principles of the Open Database License are very similar to Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike. So you're, you give your data to OpenStreetMap, we have to say where it came from, um, and if we give it to anyone else, we have to give it under basically the same terms, so it's viral. Um, but what it allows for is things like uh, mashups. At present in OpenStreetMap, if you place, if you draw a lot of dots on OpenStreetMap's data, technically you're, that's infective. Even if the data came from a separate database with separate geocoding, with separate everything, and you lay that on top, because the underlying picture of the OpenStreetMap map is, co is covered by the Creative Commons license. So we don't think that's very good because we want people to be able to overlay data on OpenStreetMap without touching and infecting everything that exists. It's a bit like using open source software but not wanting you know, two pieces of software, even though they're not commingling, to for that license to start being effective. So the open database license allows you to do things like make a paper map or make a picture of a map, and then the contents of that are not necessarily um, infective, but the underlying data remains uh, open source. And it's the data that we really care about, and we want to allow as many uses of the data as possible while at the same time forcing that feedback loop so that if people modify the underlying data, they have to give it back. And if you have any licensing questions, I don't have any answers. Um, it's been very controversial, as you might, uh, might have gathered. And so I think, um, just to say a bit of a funny side to this, I think if we look back two or three years ago when this process began, we, we might have uh, done a few basic things to make the process go easier. And this makes more sense to the in-crowd. We could have given OpenStreetMap a better logo, uh, Open Database License a better logo, uh, introduce puppies and kittens, I think that's always good. <laughs> um, give it a better name. Um, the ADBL is very short and doesn't really mean anything. It could be a disease for all I know. So Steve's Privatization Investment Act, there's a, a, a strong conspiracy theory that the entire open database license process and everyone involved is at my uh, fingertips. Um, people's license for social justice, I think, would have passed a lot quicker. And of course, explosions. Every, every license needs some explosions. Um, but let's turn to the future a little bit. We get a lot of these kinds of uh, comments from people on the wiki, on the mailing list, uh, in IRC. People coming along and say, look, there is some uh, problem on the map, but I don't know how to fix it. Um, or there's some problem on the map, and I don't have the time to fix it. Or I would like to hook up with people, and I don't know how to, because there's 50 different ways of contacting people in OpenStreetMap and so on. And as an open source project, we haven't been entirely responsive to that, because it's, it's a project um, run and created by, by duocracy. And we need people to go in and sort of have this overarching uh, I guess vision for how to do the design in OpenStreetMap and it's something that I continually push. So in 2011 this is what I want OpenStreetMap to look like. This is how it looked like today and this is uh, Girona. Um, it's quite funny actually that Girona, uh, Girona is uh, just northeast of uh, Barcelona in Spain and data was imported by, from the local government by uh, Ivan Sanchez and others in OpenStreetMap to the point where they uh, imported every single tree which is all those green dots on that map. Um, but as I told Ivan, I think he's just covering up for the fact that he actually went around every tree logging where it was. Um, so I think you know, we can remove the sidebar, move the logo up a little bit, uh, give the map more prominence on the site, like everyone else does. Um, simplify and uh, make a bit prettier those tabs. Um, I would hide everything under help and more, uh, including you know, video introduction, three minute video introduction, a bunch of help links, that kind of thing. Um, have a very simple search box with a example of what to put in the search box already there um, and then you basically get towards the the kind of mock-ups that a few people including me have done in the past so although OpenStreetMap looks a bit backward right now there are people thinking about this and trying to make it happen and if you want to help you definitely most definitely can um, the other thing we need to do I think is connect the the tail of the types of contributors we have in OpenStreetMap um, this is typical long, long tail graph, I think stolen from Wikipedia. Um, you have people on the left hand side of the graph who spend little time on OpenStreetMap, but there are a lot of them. So you have a lot of people who come to this, the site for one, two, three, four, five minutes, something like that. And then you have far fewer people, those on the right hand side, who are people like you and me, I think, 
who spend all day on OpenStreetMap, but there's far, far less of us. Right? And this is a typical distribution for any open source projects and user contributed data. Um, so I did this at State of the Map in Spain. I'm going to do it again with you guys, liven you up a little bit. I'm going to have some audience participation here. Um, well, I'm going to get you all to stand up, first of all, and really illustrate the problem that we have connecting the two types of users that we have. So please all stand. I promise this won't be a religious summary. <laughs> right. What this graph shows is the breakdown of OpenStreetMap users and how much data they're editing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So I want everyone to pick a random letter, A, B, or C. Have you all got your letter? Okay, let's try that again. Have you all got your letter? Yes. 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 Okay. Now, everyone A and C, sit down. So all of you guys, that's roughly two-thirds of you, are people who uh, have never even mapped an OpenStreetMap. You've gone to the site, you've figured out how to uh, create an account, you've gone back to your email, you've clicked the acceptance link, you've got an account, and you never even map. Right? So we just dropped two-thirds of you. Um, out of the remaining one-third, um, roughly, uh, let me see, 20% of you, so pick a number between 1 and 10. You got a number? Uh, one, yeah, 1 and 10. Everyone between 3 and 10 can sit down. So you're all people who uh, have mapped once. All those people who sat down are people who have mapped basically once and then gone away. Right? So now we're only left with three people, which makes it basically silly. So only one of these three people is an active mapper compared to the potential entire community of OpenStreetMap. And you guys can sit down now. Thank you very much. Um, and that's important, because that's you guys, that's the average Joe, all the people who sat down throughout that experiment, and we need to connect you somehow. Those people took the time to register, they took the time to get to know OpenStreetMap, but they still found it too difficult to map. And we need things um, like the site simplification and good feedback mechanisms, so that instead of spending five minutes figuring out how to register, getting frustrated, and then going away forever, that you spend that time at least giving us some little piece of useful data, like your street is wrong, or like that guy who wanted to connect and map as nearby him, but found the process entirely too frustrating. And I hope that, although you know, that little exercise illustrated to you just how many people, because we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people now, who have this issue. So I strongly think that if you look on the, the right-hand side, it's cut off a little bit, but we should have some kind of very easy feedback mechanism, as you're seeing pop up on sites all over the web right now. That feedback button on the right, um, if you click it, it should pop up with something very, very simple that says, do you want to give some map feedback or do you want to give some website feedback? You click on one of them and you get a box. And that's it. As simple and utterly simple as possible. You already know where the view user is viewing because the map in the background has its latitude, longitude and at the zoom level. So if someone says A street is wrong, you know where A street is already because they're looking at it on the map. Um, Perhaps you want to put some contact details in there and then you want them to have it submitted and then they go back. We need it to be that simple. At the moment it is nowhere near that simple. You don't need a degree in GIS but you do need a significant amount of time to edit an OpenStreetMap and we need to bring that down. And map editing is inherently difficult, right? So we can sidestep the entire problem of trying to make an easy to use map editor just by utilizing having that feedback loop from those people spending five minutes telling people like me who are happy to sit there all day fixing all of these bugs. I think. The other thing we need to do is show our errors more clearly. This is OpenStreetMap a few years ago when it was incomplete. So you see there's problems with this map. You know, we don't show what the road names are, for example. It's clearly incomplete, just like this. This is London from a few years ago. This is back when you could tell where the mappers were. You could tell that there was a guy in the north and a, a guy in the south, that kind of thing, until they joined up and, you know, how OpenStreetMap looks today when it's all looks very, very complete like this. But back then, when the map looked like that, it was very clear where we could fix things. It was clear where roads had no name, it was clear where we had no data whatsoever. It's far less clear here. What, what do you fix? No one, it's very, very difficult to see. You don't know if some roads look, you know, they're rendered correctly, but they're not actually correct. They're not actually uh, connected in a, in a topological sense. Um, you don't know where the errors are in terms of, you know, what roads don't have names, what footpaths are just on their own, not connected to anything, things like that. We do have the technology to do all this, though. We have uh, what's called the no-name style, and we have other tools in OpenStreetMap which show the errors. So I think a bit like when you read a Wikipedia article and you can instantly see what the problems are, you can see if there's a misspelling because you're reading it. You can see if it's missing a comma or there's not enough text just by reading it. We need to show the worst face of OpenStreetMap to the public, not the best, because that will lead to data that's 
fixed far more quickly by more people because there's an imperative to because when you look at a map like that there's there's almost a compulsion to go and fix it but when you look at that you think oh that's great I'll just go and use that data and I think there's lots and lots of other types of data that we can fix especially here in the US like connectivity like turn restrictions and all the other things we need in the United States to make the the map truly readable and displace now to tell you atlas which will happen um, Potlatch 2 is coming out. Um, lots of people are frustrated with Potlatch. I promise you it's getting better. It has a better user interface. Um, it's written in a language called ActionScript 3, which means normal programmers can actually help with it. Um, and it has a what you see is what you get kind of interface, which Potlatch currently doesn't have. Um, here's one of the beta views of it. Ignore the data on the right that's all scribbles. It's just test data. But it's you know a lot closer to uh, Maps Ends Aim in terms of um, making an editor that is you know, usable by, by normal quote unquote people out there without having to dig into huge amounts of depth on the open street map wiki and mailing list to figure out how you tag a road or a footpath, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that of course we have to mention, you probably all know, is Haiti, right? This is what Haiti looked like pre-earthquake. Um, Post-earthquake it grew very, very quickly due to lots of good people like um, Kate and Mikel and others flying out there, running around with GPSs and pieces of paper and making maps. And there's probably more people who deserve a round of applause here, but I don't know you all, but thank you. Um, that map data was incredibly useful, and what it points to is something that OpenStreetMap has always been about, is that this map data and these tools are usable everywhere. Although OpenStreetMap started in the UK because of some bozo government stuff hangover from the 1800s, um, it's really not about a single country or a single data model. And as much as this is useful for humanitarian reasons in Haiti, OpenStreetMap is also not you know, just about humanitarian stuff. It's about mapping the entire world for free and giving it away and really changing the paradigm of the way this stuff works and making it usable and actually saving lives. But the thing I always have to point out about this when I hear from people about how OpenStreetMap save lives is you know, there's a corollary to that, which is if OpenStreetMap goes down, presumably that means we kill people. And I don't think that the project is really ready for that, right? If the servers go down and we have another earthquake and people, a load of people fly out and they need that data and we're not there, that makes us a point of failure, which I prefer not to be um, and have that kind of responsibility. So if we compare the, the United States to the rest of the planet to make a uh, very rough analogy, and this is a bit hand wavy, I'm gonna talk about data sets in this scatter plot. And each of those yellow dots represents a data set um, and I've hand-wavingly given each, each one a, a quality metric. So that means, is it complete? Is it the entire US or is it just Georgia? Um, is it all of the uh, interstate system but none of the other roads? Um, so in terms of scale. And then also, is it up to date? So it's a complete map of the US but from 1950, that kind of thing. So if you hand-wavingly put those things together, data sets have quality <coughs> and they also have a price. In the US, it looks roughly something like this. And you can shout at me if you think Tiger is lower, lower, or higher, higher. Um, Tiger isn't super very good quality, but it is public domain, which makes it zero price. And then people took Tiger and other things, uh, county data sets, blah, blah, blah. They pushed them up the quality graph by fixing them, by driving rounds. This is what people at Teleatlas and Avtech did back in the day. Um, and because they pushed them up the quality line, that meant they were able to lift up the, the price of each individual data set. And this is pretty much the US only. Every other um, Western country looks a bit more like this. You have a national mapping agency at the top right, so you have something like the Ordnance Survey, or you have various different cadastres and stuff in different European countries. Uh, you also have the situation in every country that a Western country used to own, pretty much. So the Commonwealth, um, the nations that Britain used to own, um, all followed this model. They all have their own Ordnance Surveys with various level of funding. They're all monopolies, effectively. And they tend, although not, this isn't always the case, they tend to have very, very co good quality data for the type of data they collect. So the Ordnance Survey knows exactly where every curb is in the United Kingdom. They know where every, the outline of every building very, very well. They have um, a government's goal of showing uh, any change in the map within six months, or 99.8.3 or something percent of changes within uh, six months. So it's good data. It's also very expensive, which is why it's high up. Um, and this is what we're trying to defeat with OpenStreetMap, which is somewhere down on the bottom left. Now, I'd argue that we're not quite you know, that low on the quality line, but I'm, I'm doing that to placate people. Um, 
think OpenStreetMap is still not very good data, but it is very good for you if you're in London. London's done. It's good if you're in Haiti for your use case. For those use cases, it might be 100%. But we're talking overall for the Western world plus you know, various bits of the rest of the world, it's not 100% yet. Um, but those use cases, those ones highlighted by that yellow box, means there's a feedback loop. As more people find OpenStreetMap useful for their use case, they bring in more and more people, which is why we get that exponential growth um, in terms of the amount of users and the number of people. I posit that OpenStreetMap will continue to the right. It continues to get better. It has done for the last six years. And as it goes to the right, that means this happens. It means that national mapping agencies have to come down in price. So actually, they, that arrow might move down and to the left as well, as they have less money to, to do this stuff. And it's starting to happen, I'm pleased to say. Just to give you two examples, um, the Ordnance Survey in the UK released a lot of its data under an open license. It's not the best data they have, um, but they released it. And it wouldn't have happened without OpenStreetMap. And this is starting to happen around the world as too. And as it gets better in quality, we get more and more use cases. People like MapQuest doing open.mapquest.com. Is that correct? Yes. .co.uk. .co.uk. But .com is coming, right? We'll talk about that after lunch. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no comment from the gentleman. Um, not just these guys, of course. Uh, Bing just started using, uh, allowing you to use OpenStreetMap within Bing Maps. Um, there's many, many companies uh, starting to use this. This isn't just, you know, open source sandal wearing hackers in their basement. Speaking as someone wearing sandals who used to live in the basement. Um, this stuff is really, truly usable, and that's an amazing thing to see. You know, these milestones that we're seeing all of us, as a result of these use cases happening. And it will get bigger and bigger over the time, to the point where, you know, Teleatlas and Navtech start taking this threat seriously, and then we might have to worry, but let's ignore that problem. Um, so I'll close with a little bit of fun. I really like what Airbus used to do with their aircraft. Um, when they tested aircraft, they blazed on the side what they thought about them. They thought their planes were things like longer, larger, farther, faster, I think it's higher, quieter, and something. Smooth. Smoother. Um, they felt very good about their, um, their products, even if they did have jokes embedded in them. <laughs> <laughs> that was done on purpose. <laughs> NASA did something similar for a while. Um, they had this program of, of doing faster, better, cheaper uh, uh, vehicles, uh, satellites, and missions to other planets as a new way of, instead of doing big top-down bureaucracy, of trying to encourage innovation and, and you know, doing better with your taxpayer dollars. I think OpenStreetMap reflects that. I think we're faster, better, and cheaper, and that really sums up OpenStreetMap's value proposition compared to basically everybody else. Um, and with that, I thank you very much for listening. But no license questions. No license questions. <laughs> I'm only joking. You can ask me a license question, but I might not answer. Everyone's stunned in silence. Go on, I'll buy you a beer if someone asks a cough for a question. Oh, <laughs> first beer. There you go, Andy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I'm curious, what is the 2011 prediction? You said it's going to be big, and, and you've you predicted the past. What is, what is it, January 1, 2011? What is it, January 1, 2012? And you have a demographic breakdown by countries. <laughs> <laughs> That's question. I think it's very difficult to predict. And my well-known predictions from things like 2006, where I said uh, the UK would be complete by 2008, um, are, are hard to pull off because it's very lumpy. Although we have that exponential curve, right? You, in the US, everything's taking off exponentially as well. It's behind the rest of the world because it didn't have the same problems, right? But it's very lumpy based on where people are. So. I could tell you roughly how it's going to look, but I wouldn't know where it is. So, for example, you know, Washington is doing so amazingly because of you and Kate and others, right? But then, you know, Arkansas perhaps not. I don't know, right? Um, I think really it comes down to the use case, and what I think you're really driving at is at what point will uh, people like MapQuest being large providers just switch over to using OpenStreetMap totally? And I think that's within three years, probably two. Um, but other than that, I don't know. Anyone else? Mike? Sorry, uh, this is not actually a licensed question. You don't get a beer, by the way. <laughs> 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 okay, it is a licensed question. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's going to be this removal process where data, where people don't, you know, 
if people don't approve the ODBL for their own data, then it's going to get removed from the database at some point. What is the plan or what are some ideas around how to make it visible where those pieces are being removed uh -huh. and to get them replaced? Um, the short answer is that there isn't much of a plan. And the reason for that is that we don't know the scale of the problem. If the scale of the problem is 90% of people say no, then we're going to have to have a serious rethink, right? And not even proceed with that process. What Mike's referring to is within, within the license change, we will inevitably have people who either don't respond to the change, have passed away, or just plain say no. Um, and we're going to have to remove their data because we can't relicense it um, just based on me making the decision. We have to ask them. And if they're not around to or they say no, then we have to remove that data. We hope the, the problem is going to be relatively small, especially because of the long tail nature of the data. So although there's something like 200,000 people who we have to ask to move over, um, as you've seen from sitting down, 170,000 of them have never entered any data, so they, we just automatically move them over the next time they log in. Then out of the remaining people, although you know, there's 20 odd thousand um, contributors who have added any significant amount of data, only 20% of them have actually entered any significant amount of data, right? So if we can get pretty much the top, I think it's top 500 or top 1500 people, we get 85% of the data. And that's very, very easy to do um, because it's people like me and you, know, you right? People who, who are key. Then for the outliers, there's also an, uh, uh, some stuff we can do, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not strictly sure of this, but below a certain threshold of the amount of data you've edited, and also the type of data you've edited, there's no creativity involved, so it's automatically in the public domain. So if, you, if you've an, entered one point of interest, that's pretty much there's no creativity in that work, and there's no sweat of the brow rights, as far as I know. So we can automatically move you over. So what we're really dealing with are a few loan cases of uh, people holding out because they, they think there's a conspiracy theory or they think the project's going to die or we're going to have to delete all of Australia. And there's people trying to hold us to ransom saying, well, if you change license, then I'm going to take away all my toys right? and I'm not going to share with you anymore. So for those very few people, I suspect what's going to happen is we're going to have to delete their data in a very specific area. Right? So there might be you know, one specific area of Australia that we can have to remove. But I would counter that if you look at the exponential growth of OpenStreetMap, that's, that's a blip. Right? Because yes, let's say we remove all of London. We could map all of London again within, I don't know, two, three, four months, if that, just with the volunteers that we already have. And it, if anything, they'll do it with relish because it takes them back to the old days where they're out surveying again. Um, so I think it's not that big of a problem. And I also think it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Right? And a few people are, are helping create that and helping create the impression that there's going to be this vast blackout when there really isn't. Um, so short answer is I don't know. Has anybody been, this, this long tail thing is like, I really picture make it a game that somebody can click on without any particular expertise mm -hmm. to do some things. Have you heard of Anybody working on that sort of thing? Um, well, early on in the project's history, there were a few people who called editing as join the dots for stoners, because you would sit there all day <laughs> fixing stuff. Um, and that, that kind of crowdsourcing of having throwing off some, some kind of data as the result of, a, of an activity. So for example, uh, Foursquare generates a big point of interest database as a result of people wanting to tell their friends what Starbucks they're at. Um, there are those kinds of uh, projects available that people could do, like we could make our own open source Foursquare or, or something, right? There are a few uh, games companies I've talked to in San Francisco that wanted to make editing the map part of the game and throwing that stuff off. But I'd, I'm not aware of anyone actively doing it. Um, no. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much.